evening, good afternoon, or maybe it's a good morning, and welcome to everyone joining live from around the world, and hello to those who might be joining us back on YouTube at a later date. My name's Penny, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening and to be spending the evening with you and our fantastic guests. I'm decided, um, delighted to welcome you to this third and final Polar Pint of Science event brought to you by the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust and the UK Polar Network. The UK Polar Network is an organisation that brings together scientists from all across the UK to develop skills, to put on workshops, to educate and to put on fantastic events just like this one this evening. And the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust is a charity that preserves and shares the legacy of the pioneers of exploration and science in Antarctica. Now, you might have already joined us for some events already. Of course, we've had Polar Past. Maybe you've learned something about women in Antarctica, or maybe you learned about Halley or heroism, or maybe you joined us for the Polar Present, for a brilliant talk by Geraint, or maybe you learned about how microbes are melting the Greenland ice sheet. Well, if you missed any of those events, of course, don't worry. You can go back to the Pint of Science YouTube channel and you can watch them back at any time. Well, tonight we're joined by some equally fascinating guests. We have got Dr. Chad Briggs, who's going to be surprising us with how to avoid surprises. And we have Dr. Hannah Cuban, who I'm sure will rustle up something special for you this evening. Well, Pint of Science, if you don't know what it's about, is usually held in a pub. And the idea is that you have a drink, maybe it's a pint, maybe it's something different, and you sit back, relax, and you enjoy the science. Well, we want tonight, even though it's a webinar, to emulate this same feeling. So for this evening, I'm joining you with a very festive uh, pumpkin spice tea, of course. Halloween is coming up very soon. But we would love to hear from you. Where are you joining us from? What are you drinking? And if you like puns just as much as me, and you can think of any that are related to the speakers that we have this evening and their topics, we want you to post them in the comments section. Throughout this event, we're going to be joining you in the comments section and we're going to be bringing and sharing your comments live with everybody. So do post away. And of course, we also have our socials. So on social media, you can join us on our hashtag Polar Pint of Science and you can tag away and share all your excitement about this event. Maybe you can get people to join us live this evening or maybe you can also encourage them to watch back at a later date. So what's tonight all about? Well, tonight we're going to the polar future and it's all about the climate crisis. And our fantastic guest speakers this evening are gonna be talking to you about how we can build resilience for the unexpected. And then they're also gonna be talking to you about the power of the village and how you can become a walrus detective and do conservation science from your own home with a lot of fun tusks or fun tasks, depending on which way you like to, to call it. So we want this event to be as interactive as possible. So tonight we invite you to put your comments into the comments section on YouTube, ask questions that you would like to direct to Hannah and Chad at any time, you can do so, put them in there. The idea of this evening is you'll see on the screen, first we're gonna hear from Chad and then we're gonna hear from Hannah and then we'll be posing your questions live in a QA and a at the end. So let's get to it. First up we have Dr. Chad Briggs and Chad is, joining us all the way from Alaska, which is incredible. And Chad is a graduate director at the College of Business and Public Policy at the University of Alaska in Anchorage, and is also a member of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. And before this event, Chad shared with me a story that I wanted to pass on. And this relates to his time back in the US at high school when he was with his best friend's parents and they said to him, one day you are going to appear on CNN and you are going to be saying to us, you see, I told you so, I warned all of you and you didn't listen, did you? No. Well, at this point, Chad then told me that maybe, just maybe, some people are born to be a Cassandra. And I have to admit, Chad, I did have to go away and look at what a Cassandra was. <laughs> and it is somebody that like, is able to predict misfortune. Well, at this point, CNN have not invited Chad on, but if anybody is listening and is from CNN or does know somebody from CNN, do get in touch with Chad and invite him on, of course. And uh, with that, Chad, I'll pass it over to you, and we are very excited to hear your talk this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid it's a little too early in the morning for a pint of beer here, but um, I'll do my best. Sun is actually just coming up. Um, thank you very much. And what I'd like to do is focus, and, and this isn't specific to the Arctic, although I'll give examples for um, how we apply this to the Arctic region. And what I'd like to just explain is how it is that we, meaning 
talking about our experiences, both in the US government, but also at universities, how we've been working to try to anticipate the future, not necessarily predict it, but at least to figure out what might happen in the future, how we can anticipate potential shocks and changes, and then communicate that to other people so that when you have people in Glasgow at the COP and they say, well, 1.5 or 2, 2 degrees Celsius, I mean, what's, what's really the difference? The ability to be able to transfer that knowledge and to be able to take local experts and take their knowledge and be able then to communicate to policymakers and say, this is why these things are really important. That's what I'm going to try to get across, at least in the next few minutes. So first to start, let me give a short bit of background in that this really started in Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe. I was working on post-conflict reconstruction and how to determine, how do you make investments? How do you decide where to put money, where to make projects? Where do you know where the environmental risks are going to be if you don't have any data? When we worked in Bosnia and Herzegovina, no one even knew how many people lived in the country, let alone had any environmental or health data. But yet there were still methodologies that we could use in order to try to figure this out. We could look for critical vulnerabilities in the system. That is, rather than looking at the average and trying to do a whole of country assessment, we could try to just focus on particular areas. And this was taking methodologies from field epidemiology, that we would work with local experts who would give us narrative advice and, and tell us, well, no, I, I think you need to go to this city or you need to look at this town or you need to look at this power plant so that we would know where to marshal resources and where to look first. And then once we figured out where the vulnerabilities in the system were, that would tell us where we would invest, where we would have to increase our investment for resilience so that the community could still maintain any sort of growth without all of these externalities, without all these horrible things happening on the side. And ultimately it came down to the question, but how do we anticipate these things that we don't know? Uh, maybe they've not happened before. Maybe we're in a completely new situation. So the US government approached me and asked, well, you know, can you do this with the climate? This is about 2007, 2008. And it was a really intriguing question. We were just being flooded with all sorts of new climate data and we needed to make sense of it. We needed to try to figure out, well, what's actually gonna happen to us? And rather than thinking that things were gonna happen to other people far away, maybe they were gonna happen to us at home. And especially considering the experience of the US after Hurricane Katrina, that was a real question. So the way we did this, both at the Department of Energy and then with the Air Force, was first we would set up a process where we would try to find the right ingredients. This would mean working with a lot of the locals, people who worked in an area that might be impacted by climate change. We could take the global climate models, but downscaling those and figuring out that, okay, this is an area of potential weakness. Maybe there's gonna be a lot of precipitation change or temperature change, but regardless, we need to figure out what's gonna happen in this area. So we would look both at linear, meaning general trends that would be increasing over time and generally were predictable. Things like population changes, and where people were living and economic changes and other sorts of technological issues. But then we would look for abrupt drivers. This would mean things that would just suddenly change, that you, you would jump from one state of stability into instability. I mean, think of eutrophication of water, right? Where things just overnight seem to change. And we know that this is possible, but it's very difficult to predict. And even if we have a sense of it as scientists, that doesn't mean that we can put it into the published literature and have a 95% confidence interval where we know it's gonna be passed. We generally can prove it after it's happened. But for policy, we can't wait until after things have happened. So we would look actually for the uncertainty. And this was one of the key lessons that we got from the intelligence community and from the military. In the science community, we are always taught to reduce uncertainty, to try to get it down to as minimal level as possible before we can start talking about it. But there are other communities in which uncertainty is actually really useful and identifying where there are uncertainties, what type of uncertainty it is, where the uncertainty comes from. Um, can we do anything about it? Is there anything that we can do in terms of monitoring or better research or increase in funding? Or does this just have to do with methodological issues or complexity? And what are the implications of that? If we're not watching something carefully, what does that mean? 
And we've had many cases of this in climate science where, for example, because there was so much investment in atmospheric sciences or oceanographic sciences, that cryology tended to lag a little bit, right? And the modeling capabilities there. So what we were trying to do is to give an example, say, okay, well, we don't know what's happening in Greenland in around 2008. The scientists do have some idea, but it didn't make it into the latest IPCC report. So let's try to figure out what's not being talked about and what risks exist with those. Then what we would do is take all of these ingredients and any one of them individually would make sense, right? And you'd say, okay, well, that makes sense. This is probable, sure. But in combination, people would say, oh, no, 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 no. This would, this would be too improbable. The thing is, those are exactly the situations that we're facing today. And those are the things that usually create the sort of disasters that we need to prepare for. So by doing this, we could stress test systems. We could use a number of different combinations of ingredients, place it on a geographical area, talk to the people who live there, who can then say, this is realistic, this isn't realistic, give us some sort of idea of how people would react to the situation. And then we would start mapping. We would map the cascading impacts. And usually what we would find is that it wasn't the direct impact that was most worrying. It was usually something secondary or third, you know, tertiary. It, it was somewhere over the horizon that we weren't looking at that. And then it would give us some sort of indication that, okay, that's something we need to focus on much more clearly and then communicate. Ultimately, we would be looking for critical nodes. This is a military term which refers to key parts of systems, which if they're removed or damaged or destroyed, means that the rest of the system is no longer working. In ecology, you might think of this as a keystone species, but it also works in terms of infrastructures and societies. Also, we would be looking at critical peripheries. In other words, those are the areas over the horizon where we're not looking very carefully and where we think that it's not connected to everything else, but in fact it is, and it's really important. And I'll give an example quickly from what we're doing here in Alaska. So this was an interesting story where it was communication from a local person, in this case an artist, who was working in an area called Berry Arm. Um, this is a, a fjord that exists in Prince William Sound, not too far from Valdez. And she noticed that the land just didn't look quite right. Now, what had happened was that the Berry Glacier had retreated. It had eventually gone up all the way to this mouth here, but then over the past decades had retreated. And what she'd noticed was that this area of land, which the ice had buttressed, had suddenly started to just shift a little bit. And the worry then, when she communicated this to her brother, who happened to be a tsunami expert, was that in places like Alaska, and we also see this in Greenland to a limited extent in Norway, is you can get abrupt shifts. In other words, the, the mountainside can suddenly just collapse into the fjord and it can create a massive tsunami. We've seen examples of this in the past in Alaska in terms of Latuya Bay, um, in terms of Tan Fjord, and these are not minor, minor um, tsunamis in any way. This would be, for example, in Latuya Bay, a 300, over 300 meter wave. And when it hits the side of the fjords, it can run up, um, up over 500 meters. Now, even though this isn't a very highly populated area, you do have cruise ships here, you have campers, you have fishers. And the question for us then as scientists was, well, we need to warn people. We can't wait until we get full funding and until we, we can do all the scientific studies. We, we actually have to communicate this somehow. But even when we were coming up with a research project, we had to do it in a way that included the local communities because they were directly affected. They needed to know, well, this is how this is going to affect the town of Whittier, for example. This is how this is going to affect um, telecommunication cables, which are underwater at the mouth of Prince William Sound. And all those little bits of information were really important for us because every time we tried running through what the impacts were, we found out that sometimes the things we were most worried about actually weren't that important and that it was other things things that ended up being far worse than what we'd anticipated. So when we were trying to model this, conceptually anyway, we came up with this idea that first we have to come up with landslide models and tsunami models and work with people who are good at remote sensing and satellite data and try to come up with some sort of predictive model for when these abrupt changes might occur. But even then, we had to work with the people who actually live in the area, who actually operate there, everything from cruise line operators to the military um, to local fishermen and campers and then work in those sorts of workshops where we figure out not just what's happening with the landslide or the tsunami itself, but everything around it. Everything from COVID and the pandemics to wildfires to ransomware attacks on a local airport. 
And even though people might think, well, those aren't related at all, they are, they all tie together because ultimately it comes back to resilience and focusing on certain things in response means that maybe we're not looking at something else. So when we ran this as a war game this past summer with some of my graduate students, just as an example, everyone was so focused on a tsunami occurring that the thing that really knocked the system out was a wildfire that everyone kept thinking, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait until it was too late and then it overwhelmed the Alaska pipeline. And this is an example that oftentimes we're focusing so much on one area that we're not making the necessary investments and acting early enough in one other area. So when we talk about trying to anticipate the future, there are a few things that I can emphasize. First, smaller countries can take the lead. Even though when we talk about climate security, and there were recent reports that came out in the past week that talk about how the US government is really worried about security implications of climate change, people don't have to wait for the United States to come up with reports like this. Smaller countries do have the resources because ultimately this means coming up with networks of scientists. Uh, and we can put in chat an example and a link to a National Science Foundation network that I work on with some of my colleagues at Georgetown University to try to map where people are going to be migrating with regards to climate change in the Arctic. But it doesn't just have to be the big countries. And in fact, the big countries aren't always the best places to do this. The US has massive resources for determining assessments for climate security, but it has its own problems as well. And I don't mean just politically. It means that oftentimes we focus too much on secrecy if the word security is attached to it. And that's something that is really important to keep in mind because too often the government will have data, but they won't share it. Or it will take data from the locals, but it won't involve them in the process any further or from scientists. And for scientists who are listening in, I'm sure you will understand if you're asked for information, you don't simply want to hand over your whole data set. You want to shepherd it. You want to be able to explain, well, this is why we interpreted things this way. This is why we think that the model should be set up this way. In other words, you're shepherding the uncertainty. And again, it's the communication of that uncertainty, which was so key to understanding for policymakers where we need to look at the risk. So keep everything in the open. And lastly, I can say that this isn't just about adaptation. Oftentimes when we talk about future risks, we can, we can look at, um, well, the resilience is going to be low here. So let's just shore things up. And as an example, we had a really great project in Hawaii with the US Air Force, and we determined that there were key vulnerabilities in its energy and food imports, the island of Oahu. And we communicated that and things did change. But that still doesn't really get to the root of the matter where we want to avoid all of these things in the first place, which means not just adapting to climate change, but communicating this to policymakers, the people who are making decisions at, for example, the COP meeting in Glasgow, and really communicate that these things are important. We can't, we can't turn back. These are irreversible changes. They, they are potentially catastrophic, and they will be hitting places far beyond just over the horizon. Um, psychologically, we tend to think that the worst impacts will hit other people far away. But what we've seen this year and last year is that these things happen in places that we're not expecting them anymore. This past summer uh, in British Columbia in Canada, the town of Lytton recorded the highest temperature ever recorded in Canada, um, just a shade under 50 degrees Celsius. And the very next day, the entire town burned down. I don't mean that metaphorically. The whole village was gone by the next day. We're seeing things that we haven't seen before. We need to be able to anticipate that, but then also make the necessary changes in our energy systems in order to avoid that future in the first place. So I know this is a really rough and quick overview of everything. Um, I did explain this in much more detail in our book, Disaster Security, but I also want to leave time for people to ask questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. That was an incredible talk and it was great to listen to. And it's fantastic to hear that you're incorporating local knowledge into your models, because I think that's a very, very valuable source of information. So for the moment, Chad, we'll say thank you and we'll join you again at the live Q&A. Um, and now for everybody listening, we will be sharing links to Chad's work and do join us in the comment section and find those so you can learn more. And, and yeah, Go away and read, of course. And then for, uh, for everyone, please do post in your questions so that we can pose those to Chad at the end in the live Q&A. As we go along, it doesn't disturb the speakers, so do post them as we go.
All right, so I said earlier that we would check in where people are joining us from. So, and also what you're drinking. So let's see if we've had any people coming into the comments section. Okay, perfect. We've got Sue. Hi, Sue, joining us from Sheffield. And I'm delighted to hear that you're enjoying, enjoying the talks. Fantastic. Bruni is joining all the way from Australia. Good day to you too. And have we got anybody else? Let's have a look. Robin joining us from Bolton. Hi, Robin. It's very nice to have you. Thanks for joining us this evening. And has anybody shared with us what they're drinking? There we go. And even a pun. Amazing. So hi, Russ. I hope you're enjoying your Coca-Cola. <laughs> Fab. Okay. All right, then. So let's get to the second talk. So our second talk is by uh, Dr. Hannah Kuben. And Hannah is a whale lover from France who, at 11 or 12 years old, was on Google Earth trying to find whales from space. And she wasn't successful, but then 15 years later, she was trying again as part of her PhD study in whales from space, where she successfully found a whale all the way from space using satellite imagery. And this led Hannah to her current position as a research associate at the British Antarctic Survey and WWF as part of their Wars from Space project. Now, Hannah's interest and what she wants to do is to develop space technology to study wildlife, particularly marine wildlife in remote locations. And this is where she's going to call on you. She would like you to join her as a walrus detective. So uh, without further ado, let's jump on a rocket up to space. Let's join Hannah and let's go and see what walrus look like from space. So Hannah, over to you. Thank you, Benny. And hello, everyone. So tonight I'm joining with uh, half a pint of tea with a little narwhal. It's a marine mammal. It has a tusk, so the closest I could find to a walrus. Um, so yeah, as Penny said, let's let's dive in. Let's dive in into this world of walrus. First, I'd like to talk to you a bit about yeah this walrus from space project. So it first originated in the mind of Rod Downey from WWF and Peter Fretwell from the British Antarctic Survey. They were sat in a cafe in Cambridge and thought, why not try this? Because a bit of background is that at the British Antarctic Survey. We have a lot of expertise about using satellite images to study wildlife. So some of my colleagues have looked at penguins, albatross and seals. I've looked at whales and we thought, why not walrus? And why walrus? Because they live in a remote place where it is hard to go as often as we wished by boat or plane. And we couldn't survey the whole area where they found. And this is something satellites allow us to do. Then the other thing, the other advantage of using satellites when it comes to walrus is that they tend to get spooked by boats and low flying plane, but a satellite 200 miles up in the sky or 600 kilometers, if you're like me and you understand kilometers better, it's not going to disturb them. So this is a non-invasive method that we wish to investigate and see how we could best use it to study walrus. And so this project is a five-year project where our big overarching aim is to better understand the trajectory of walrus population because the environment is changing with climate change and we want to know how this is going to impact them so we can try and find solutions so it has the least impact and we can safeguard their future. So walrus are found all across the Arctic. So this map might look, map might look a bit unusual. Um, so we're viewing our Earth from the top of it. So Arctic Ocean is in the middle, and around it you have all the, uh, the countries bordering the Arctic Ocean. So if we look at the top of this map, you can see you have a blue patch, and this represents the distribution for the Pacific walrus. Then if we go to the bottom of the map, all the purpley um, patches, so in Canada, Greenland, uh, Svalbard, and parts of Russia, is where we found Atlantic walrus. And then in between, on the right side, are the lap, where the Laptive walrus live. So most scientists uh, or the IUCN Red List recognizes two subpopulations, the Pacific walrus and the Atlantic walrus, and they consider the Laptive walrus to be part of the Pacific. But that is uh, being debated because that was based on one genetical study and more study uh, would be needed to please some of the scientists. So with this project, we are focusing on all of the Atlantic walrus and the Laptev walrus, because the Pacific walrus move 
a lot more in between their whole lives. And we need to understand that movement a lot better before we can um, try and look at them from space. So we don't try and double count them. Walrus love to rest on ice. Sea ice for them is very important. This is where they're going to come and rest after they had a big feeding trip. I guess like any of us, after we had a big meal, we kind of want to rest and not be too active. It's also where they're going to come to breed, going to come and give birth. So it matters to them a lot. Then in the summer and autumn as well, sometimes when ice tend to melt in the Arctic, they will come and hole out on land. But if we go back to sea ice, as we know, uh, there are several scientific publications that have shown it, Arctic sea ice is reducing every year. And that means the habitat that walrus relies, rely a lot on is changing. So we need to know what this change means for them. And this is why this project. So what we're proposing to do is look at walrus when they hole out on land, because the places they hole out on land are a lot more predictable than the places when they are hole out on ice, because ice flows tend to move around a lot and that'll be a lot hard to uh, check, whereas land doesn't really move. So we have that going for us. And we're going to be using satellite images. So those are the three satellites that have and will be collecting images for this project. So we have the GOI-1 and the Worldview 2 that collect images with a 50 centimeter resolution. So imagine that a pixel on the image that you've received from that satellite represent 50 by 50 centimeters on the ground. And then we have the incredible Worldview 3 that allows us to get images with a 30 centimeter resolution. If you prefer it in fit, uh, feet, um, Worldview 3 is about one foot resolution. So really impressive. Before we can collect the satellite images, we need to know where walrus hold out on land. So this was our first step, trying to understand where walrus are found on land. And thanks to all of the knowledge that indigenous communities and local communities and scientists have gathered, we were able to come up with this map. Then we also needed to know the timing. So lucky for us, each of those points had information regarding when walrus tend to come to these places. Another important information before we could commission the satellite images was knowing the accuracy of each of those points because some of them were not as accurate. So for those, we wanted to collect a bigger satellite image around that point to make sure we had the best chance at detecting walrus from space. So now we have information could be sent to Maxar, the satellite company we used. And in 2020, from July to early October, they were able to collect images for 86% 86, uh, 86 of the whole apps. And those are the red dots you can see on this map. Then the black crosses are the one that unfortunately we either didn't get satellite images because we're not the only one asking for images from those satellites or the, the images we did get were covered in clouds or just too dark. So if walrus were present in those, we would never know. So we tried to improve our method. And this summer, from mid-July to mid-September, we were able to get 96.6% of good quality images for all those holdouts. So really, really pleased with this. So now that you're all aware that we have collected satellite images, and I'm sure when you decided to come and join us tonight, you wanted to have a little look at what was from space. So here they are. On this image, you can see a group of warriors hold out on the southern beach of this Russian island. Then if we zoom in, you can actually see each individual warriors. This is incredible. And this is possible because of very high resolution satellite imagery that allow us to get that amount of details. Now that we know we can detect walrus in satellite images, and as you've seen, we collected quite a lot of images, we need to go through them. As much as I like going through uh, satellite images to find whales, walrus, it would take too long. And same for the small team that we are. And because we know sea ice is melting fast, we need to be able to understand the trajectory of walrus population as fast as we can. 
and this is where you can help us. So on the 14th of October, we launched a citizen science campaign where you can detect whales in satellite images. And then we'll be asking you to count. But first, that phase one we launched on the 14th of October was to find in all of the images we collected where all the walruses. So all those images we collected were cut in smaller chunks of 200 by 200 meters. And those are the ones we're asking you to tell us where the walrus are. Once we know this, we'll feed this into phase two and start counting. So some of you might have already signed up. So if you have, thank you very much. And for all the others, if this is something you'd like to take part, please do. This is phase one, finding walrus. And that's what it looked like once you'll have registered and follow the short tutorial to get you up to speed with your walrus skills. Because some things might look like walrus, but aren't. Uh, some rocks can look very similar, or sometimes we had rusty barrels that did trick us, or even brown vegetation. So we'll try and tell you everything we know so you can be up to speed with our knowledge. And then once you've passed that short training, you will be fed random images like this one. And for each of them, you'll have to say whether you think they are warriors. So those are the buttons on the right. More is present, no more is present. And there is the option of poor image because although we collected only good quality images, among them, a small portion could have been uh, covered in clouds or too dark. So those ones, um, we're just telling you, just say poor image. And once that is done, we are hoping to launch phase two, and this will be counting phase. So either we'll be asking you to put individual dots on the individual walrus, and with those holdouts that are fairly small or fairly where the animals are fairly spread out, is possible. But then walrus, walrus are social animals, and they'll form tight groups, and even sometimes real larger groups. So for those, we will be asking you and ourselves, because we're also taking part in this, to draw an outline around the group of walrus. And then knowing the average size of an adult, we'll be able to estimate the number of walrus in that image. And this is a method scientists already use when looking at drone images. So if this is something you like to take part in, later we'll share the link for you to do so. But if this wasn't convincing enough, uh, we now have a short video to show you that is pretty funky, so enjoy it. Walrus from space! Sounds like an old 1950s science fiction film, but in fact, we are creating a 21st century detective story. And you could be the detective. We want your help to find lots of walrus. <laughs> Easy, right? Look, there's one now. Impressive whiskers. But walrus don't like people getting that close. The good news is satellite cameras can now take photos of all kinds of wildlife from space, including walrus. By examining thousands of these satellite images, we can help to understand how many Atlantic and Latav walrus there are, even in the remotest part of their Arctic home. And over time, we can see how they're being affected by climate change. And we need you for this walrus search. Be a part of a huge public science project and help to safeguard the future of the iconic walrus. Volunteer just 30 minutes or more and be a walrus detective today from the comfort of your own home. Whiskers are optional. Walrus! Thank you, Hannah. That video was super, super cool and almost makes me want to speak just like the guy, Walrus from Space. <laughs> Um, but yeah, on that note, thank you for an Out of This World talk. It was absolutely fabulous. And for everyone listening and joining us this evening, we're going to be popping a link into the comment section, as Hannah said, for the video and also for the link of how you can get involved. So do go along and do start counting some walrus. For now, Hannah, we'll say a huge thank you. We'll be joining you again very, very shortly for the live Q&A. 
Uh, on that note, everyone listening, pop in the comments section your questions for Hannah and for Chad. We'll be coming to them again very, very soon. But just before we do, let's go back to the comments section and let's see where you're joining us from. Let's see if there's other people that have posted in there. Uh, maybe more people have posted about what they're drinking and maybe we have some more puns in there too. Peter, from London, drinking a cold cup of tea. Peter, my cup of tea has also gone cold. So uh, welcome and I hope you enjoy this with your cold cup of tea. <laughs> Let's have a look. Teresa from Gothenburg with a coffee. Welcome, Teresa. It's very nice to have you join us this evening. I hope you're enjoying your coffee and the talks. Have we got any other people? Let's have a look. Maribel from Norwich. Hi, Maribel. Thank you for joining us with a boring glass of water and munching some crisps. I hope they're a nice flavor. Hopefully something like salt and vinegar. And then have we got anyone else? Has anyone popped any puns in? Four days in Feb. I love the Walrus Space video. Uh, thank you. I'm sure Hannah will be delighted to hear that feedback. Well, well, there we go. One more. We'll say this one more then. Russ. My name is Russ Wall. <laughs> Does that count? Fantastic. Thanks, Russ, for popping that in there. And uh, yeah, do keep them coming in. I'm sure we'll che che uh, check back in at some point. Um, but for now, let's start the live Q&A. So, I would be quite keen. I've got a, a question that I would like to, to start off with, both one for Chad and one for Hannah, and then we'll start to bring in some of the questions that we've received live in the comments section. So again, thank you, Chad, and thank you, Hannah, for the fantastic talks that you've just delivered. Um, Chad, I'm going to start with you. Uh, of course, when I introduced you, I talked about the story you shared about, becoming, uh, about the fate of you of being a Cassandra. Now, your mum obviously recognised something, uh, your best friend's mum obviously recognised something in you uh, all those years back. When for you did you notice or recognise these qualities in yourself that you were someone that was interested in climate risk and wanted to develop this further as a passion and a career? Um, I, I suppose it's a long story and I don't want to bore everyone with it. Uh, by the way, I'm drinking Earl Grey uh, this morning. Um, <laughs> I, I sort of switched back and forth between doing traditional defense studies and doing environment and trying to combine them. And I, I was kind of frustrated because when I studied in Canada um, to do my PhD, you couldn't really do environmental security studies in North America or in Europe. But it was really interesting during those PhD studies, I was doing work in Norway and I was looking at the Alta Dam and this is in far, far Northern Norway. And it was really interesting for me how the story of that and about how centralized knowledge sort of deliberately blocked out what the locals knew, the farmers, the fishermen, the local Sami, um, and, and that they really accurately predicted what was gonna happen environmentally. And this was in the 1990s and back then people were worried about climate change, but it was, it was far in the future. People really didn't know necessarily what the real impacts were gonna be. And so I, I think it really came to a head around 2007 or 2008 and, and that's when we just seem to be sort of flooded with, you know, pardon that pun, um, flooded with all sorts of new information and data uh, about what was happening. And it, it was just overwhelming. Like uh, my wife said, I didn't sleep for about nine months um, when, I, when I started working for the Department of Energy. Um, and yeah, ever since then, how can I walk away? There we are. Well, I do have probably many more questions, but there's definitely people in the comments section who I know are, are itching to have their questions asked. So I'll leave it there for the moment. And Hannah, I did have a question for you. Obviously, you're looking at these walrus and in previous, you've looked at whales from space using satellites. So do you feel connected to the, the Arctic when you're studying the, the walrus? Do you feel connected to the walrus? Like, how does that come out in your work? Yeah, it's true. I guess I have never seen a walrus face to face yet. But when you look at satellite images, you get to see the changes and things no other people see. Like between 20 and 21, suddenly you can see changes in sea ice in those images you're looking at, although I've never been there. So you do feel connected. Um, and then for me, it's more the, I guess, this Where's Wally game it is fun. You, you kind of play this like little spy trying to find those animals um, so yeah have you found Wally no I mean we might have but he's in a very tight group with his friends so it's hot to know which one he is or she 
Oh, cool. All right, then. So let's go out to the comments in the comments, the questions in the comments section, and let's see who we've had in. Sue has a question, and this one is for Chad. So, Chad, how do you explain to policymakers that uncertainties are part of the process? They seem to want everything 100% nailed down before they will act. Oh, so you're, you're absolutely correct. The, this is one of the really tough things that we try to do, because even if we know, even if we do the predictions, um, and I said we don't like to do predictions, but sometimes we get it right, you know, and, and two years before Hurricane Sandy, we published with the US Army almost exact models of what was going to happen if a hurricane turned left up and went west up um, Long Island Sound, you know, in terms of the flooding and what was going to happen with the airports and the power grids. and I, I took this upon myself as a bit of a failure because we kept having people saying, well, you know, don't, don't talk to us about stuff that's never going to happen or that's so improbable, um, or let's wait for more information. And the really hard part is that, yeah, you're right. Policymakers want to wait for full information and the people who don't want, who deliberately don't want things to happen can amplify that uncertainty, right? They, they can keep pointing out, well, we just, do we really know? No, we don't really know. And this is a really old tactic, right? This happened during the tobacco industry and um, it's happening this year with, with vaccines. Uh, but it's, it's really tough because sometimes you do just have to take responsibility, you have to take leadership and you just have to act even though you don't know all the information. Um, what we're hoping is that at least by making scenarios that seem real and by involving the policymakers in the process, that rather than just sort of handing them a report that just sits on a shelf somewhere and that they'll just kind of roll their eyes and say, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, um, this sounds interesting, but we don't think it's going to happen. If they're involved in the process, if they actually help create the scenarios, it changes the psychology because they own it, right? They were part of it. They were there at the table. And we've seen these dynamics where you have like a two-star Air Force general sitting next to a 23-year-old dolphin naturalist slash surfer. And those conversations really make a difference. Um, because they share information and that's a communication that would never happen otherwise. So that's what we're kind of hoping for. Um, the hard part is just getting people in Washington or London or Brussels, um, get, get them enough time where we can actually get them in a room to help create some of these things. Can I ask, have you seen like a, a more positive response throughout your career as you've been speaking to policymakers over time? It has changed. Um, sometimes we joke that, yeah, I've been doing this specifically about climate change for about 13 years. And sometimes I'm just updating my slides to how bad it's getting. But yeah, we, we do see a big change. I mean, it used to be that you couldn't even mention the, the so-called C word. You couldn't mention climate because everyone just got really nervous about it. Now people understand it. Um, the hard part is not going overboard and they're just thinking, well, it's too late. You know, we can't do anything anymore. Um, so that's that's the other thing we want to try to rein in and not make people think that it's just hopeless, that, that there's nothing that we can do. Um, but yes, in, in terms of the reception, I, I think people understand that these changes are real now and, and it's kind of undeniable in some ways. It's just a question then of what actions do people take in response to that. Fab. Thank you for that question, Sue. Uh, let's see if we've got another question there. So Julian, and this one is for you, Hannah. So Hannah, do you have multiple images from the same location taken at different times? I.e., could you see differences between images be detected automatically to identify uh, a candidate image for closer inspection? So with the very high resolution we collected, uh, we have one image for 2020 and then for the same place, one image in 2020 and one in 2021. But then one thing that we did do, and that is possible, is using another uh, satellite, Sentinel-2, uh, operated by the European Space Agency. So this one has a, a much lower resolution, 10 meters. So you can't detect individual waters, but you can see the, the hole out. If they're like large enough, you can see the patches. And we have looked at several images across a season for some of the hole outs and help us uh, figure out also how they change through times. But that is something we do uh, want to do as well to help us uh, figure out where the waters are and be more efficient in collecting images with using Sentinel to, to detect where the waruses are, like find those brown patches and then get the very high resolution to count them. So thank you, Julian. 
All right, let's see if we've got another question. So we've got one from Maribel, and this is again for Chad, and it's what might universities do to help promote public and policymaker understanding of climate change impacts? They can do quite a bit. And traditionally universities, and I say both in the United States and Canada and the UK, um, and by the way, I did study geography at University College London, so I, I know some of the problems in the UK as well, meaning the pressures that people who work at the universities have to publish in reputable scientific journals, right? And that makes perfect sense. But we tend, we as academics tend not to be rewarded for doing public outreach. And it's, it's great if we can incorporate that into our research somehow, but we also wanna make sure, first of all, that we're not doing this kind of colonial model. Um, and, and we have to be really careful about this in Alaska of not just flying into a village and they're so used to, okay, well, some researchers are showing up with clipboards and they want us to do another survey. Um, but the universities need to encourage this sort of public outreach of people writing blogs of maybe even doing TikTok videos of, you know, doing really fun stuff to get people involved, get them involved in the research and to get them to understand, right, that these things are real, that they're, they're going to affect not just far off places, but here are the local impacts. Um, and then also understanding how people react to that. And psychologically, it's important because if people are faced with some sort of overwhelming risk, but they're not given any sort of concrete action that they can take either to minimize the risk or to understand it better, then people tend to kind of block it off, right? And we've seen that even in the past year, people might think, well, the pandemic can't be, well, I hope it's not that bad, right? Because you, you don't wanna believe in these sorts of hopeless situations. So what we wanna do is try to engage with the public in a way that gives them kind of concrete actions that they can take and then get them really involved in the process so that this is re both real for them and so that they're not sort of fed into this kind of hopeless um, cycle of wondering, well, yeah, there's nothing we can do. And so we you know, might, might as well just enjoy things as we, uh, as we go down or you know, build, build up the walls higher and uh, keep, keep everyone else out. That sort of approach isn't very helpful. Yeah, it's great to hear you talk about outreach. And I think events like this is obviously really, really important. Um, and it's also very fabulous that you speak about colonial science, um, especially I think Hannah will probably be aware of this as somebody who can probably look at anywhere in the world using a satellite. It's very important that we think about these colonial narratives as academics and, and making sure that we are mindful of this when we do our work. And for anyone, um, that wants to learn more about it. There is somebody, a scientist named Dr. Asher DeVos, who has published articles on colonial science. You can go and read more about that. Um, so thanks for that one, Chad. Uh, we have a section at the bottom there. Remember to post your questions for speakers. We've got some exciting ones still coming in, but do keep posting so we can keep the, the live Q&A going. So let's see what other questions we've got. Here are Robin. In what months of the year are the satellite photos of walrus being taken and who decides this, Hannah? So, as I mentioned during the talk, we've collected images during uh, July to early October for 2020 and then July to mid-September in 2021. And this was based on all of the data that we were given access to from indigenous communities, from local communities and from also scientists uh, because they've recorded the timing of when warriors were found there. So that did help us in deciding when to get it. And then we also had Peter Fretwell, one of the scientists, uh, the lead scientist on this project that looked at some Sentinel-3 images uh, to look at the timing because Sentinel is a satellite that collects images all the time compared to the very high resolution satellite we use when where they only collect images when you ask them to. So with Sentinel-2, we were able to look a bit at the time lapse of when to expect walruses. And that's why it was much more, our data collection, image collection was much more improved for the year of 2021. Is it, is it something that you're gonna to continue to do from you know 2022? How long is this anticipated that you'll keep collecting images for? So the project is set for five years. Uh, that's how long we have funding for. But if it does work, uh, I guess it might continue. Uh, but yeah, it's four or five years, so 2025 will be the last year. Okay, fab. All right, thank you for that question, Robin. And let's see if we've got another one. Bruni from Australia. 
why do you think people are confusing climate change with global warming, Chad? Well, the, the different terms have been thrown around and there, there are also some theories about, uh, you know, maybe the energy companies were talking about climate change because they didn't want to just focus on, uh, you know, warming as an issue. But we do have to understand that all the climate changes that we're experiencing isn't just about average daytime high temperatures, right? And, and that's what we tend to focus on because that's what we're trained to think of in terms of what we get on the weather reports. But it's so much more than that. It's nighttime high temperatures or it's precipitation or it's changes in the biomes and the ecosystems. And I think that level of complexity becomes really difficult for people to understand because it takes a certain literacy in environmental science to understand how these interconnections occur. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, we, we do try to emphasize that climate change is the broader sort of spectrum of all the different environmental changes that can occur as a result of changes in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, and really it's precipitation changes that make some of the biggest differences. Um, so it, it's hard to translate to the public then, because again, we, we do like, okay, 1.5 degrees Celsius average. And then how do you translate that into something that's real? You know, you know what, what does that mean we get more flooding? And, or what does that mean that, um, you know, the crops are failing? Uh, Cause it didn't seem like that big a difference. So yeah, the terminology can be can be difficult because people can confuse it. So sometimes we need to, like I said, translate it into something that's real for people who live in that area. Yeah, and absolutely. And that's why I think events like this are probably a really fantastic tool to, you know, disseminate this terminology and, and make sure people understand it and, and know the ter correct terms to use. So thanks for that question. And thanks, Chad, for your answer. Um, Maribel, uh, we have another question for you, Hannah, here. How do you plan to use the counts that you've taken? So with those counts, we're hoping to take them to like one every year. And this will allow us to see a change in population or no change. But we want to look at the population trajectories and understand how this is changing. Because then once we have those counts, we will also be looking at how environmental factors, especially sea ice, like sea surface temperature or impacting uh, where worries are and um, so we can better understand what is how they're adapting as well and so we can figure out a way to safeguard their future okay thanks hannah and um, thanks maribel for the question uh toby we've got a question here for chad how do you aggregate your local study you showed us to a bigger picture of what might happen in a parallel and multiply the consequences in parallel, sorry, and multiply the consequences? OK, I'll, I'll admit that's tough because usually what we have to do is take global models and then scale them down into local impacts and then scale them back up into how these affect places that are different. So if we're trying to communicate with policymakers or military planners or whoever, um, we can come up with a really scary picture of what might happen in Bangladesh, but to convince people, say in Washington DC, that that's important for them to make some sort of action, that's tricky, right? So we, we have to show how these sort of cascades work and how they impact. But I'll, I'll admit, Toby, it's difficult because um, sometimes we don't know what other researchers are doing, right? And it can be really difficult in the research community to keep track of all the different studies that people are doing and how they might connect together. But we have really good examples of the past, even non-climate related issues, like what happened at Fukushima. So you have a tsunami and an earthquake, which then results in what nuclear power being cut off um, or being phased out much faster in Germany, right? Uh, and, and, and those sorts of cascades are the things that we're talking about. And we've seen it this past year with global supply chains, with um, any number of different issues. So you're right, finding things in parallel um, and we're going to miss things. We, we are going to miss things and things are still going to surprise us. The best we can do is at least to give us some good picture of where the vulnerabilities are so that we can just monitor it more closely. And in some ways, that's like what Hannah's doing, I suppose. You, you just you want to you want to find where you need to focus and then get the higher resolution picture. Yeah, thank you very much for that question, Toby, and thanks for the answer there, Chad. So we are coming close towards seven o'clock, so we'll have about two more questions or so, uh, and then we will look to, to wrap the event up. So, Floki, what have you posted here? We've got, I have a different question then. How can you be sure that the detections and counts of walrus are accurate? Good question. 
Yes, because it is something we need to make sure. Uh, although we're quite happy with this project because we get to engage with the public and make them feel like they can do something. Um, we need to make sure of what results we're going to get as accurate as possible. So with the detection, each of the images, like the smaller chunks that I showed earlier, that you'll be asked about, eight other people will be asked about them. So then we'll have nine answer for each of them and we'll select um, whichever answer one will be the final answer. But then for some of them, if it is a bit, we don't have an agreement at the end, we'll keep feeding that image back in. Um, so that's for detection and counts. Um, we are like working on that part now. So we're gonna, do, we'll do the same where if it's putting a dot on the walrus, we'll ask several people to look at the same image. So then we can get an average of counts because although it is a lot easier that we think initially it might be, once you actually try and count them, I, yeah, it can be a bit tricky. So we'll try and we'll find some way of assessing those uh, average and confidence levels. Are there things that look like walrus in the images that can make it confusing? Yeah, so I I have been tricked sometimes by brown patches, but then I'm like, oh, they're not on the beach. So then you kind of question, and then you scan the rest of the image and you realize that there are the brown patches more on them. So those are actually vegetation. Or I've been surprised with large piles of rusty barrels. I didn't know that was a thing you can find in the Arctic. But in Russia, it seems that there are a lot. Um, so that was quite uh, confusing sometimes. But because they were placed in a very neat way, quite often you kind of thought, mm, it's, this doesn't look right. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay, so if anyone goes and uh, joins you as a walrus detective, they need to watch out for the rusty barrels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Thanks for that question, Floki. And then, Maribel, this will be our last question um, from the comments section. So, Maribel's question is for you, Chad. And you spoke of lessons from the military, but is that the best place to discuss climate change? Yes and no. No, it's not a very good place to discuss climate change because of the secrecy issues that I described earlier. Um, they don't like to share information very well. And even to participate in the process, sometimes you need to be in that security kind of um, environment, which means that you can't share information even when you find it. But at the same time, there's something critical about what the, the military and intelligence community understand, which is that oftentimes, and this goes back to earlier questions, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to give bad news to people, um, and especially people don't like paying good money to hear things they don't want to hear. So, uh, but the military likes that, right? They like hearing bad news, and, and they like being told how bad things are going to be. And sometimes it's important just to decouple the warnings from the policy. And we forget that sometimes, that we'll, we'll start with the policy and we'll work backwards and we'll try to find evidence to marshal support for what we want to do. But sometimes that can water it down, right? Be or it'll shift it in particular ways because people just want to fit their narrative. Sometimes with climate, it's important just to say, look, this is really how bad it can be. And just to be clear about that and not necessarily say, oh, so then therefore you need to maybe leave that for someone else. But that warning itself, if it's clear and it's concise and it resonates with people, sometimes that could be more powerful than immediately trying to tie it to something political um, because otherwise others will just get immediately defensive. So I don't think it's the best place for things to happen. Um, and there are barriers, as we discussed with Penny, with universities. But um, I think some of the lessons are worth looking at. All right. Thank you very much for the answer, Chad. And thank you, Maribel, for your questions that we've received. Um, before we do wrap up the Q&A section, I do have one question that I would like to, to send to both of you to, to ask, answer for everyone listening. So obviously this event was, or this series of events, the past, the present and the future, was all about the lead up to COP, COP26 that's taking place in Glasgow at the early, month, uh, early weeks of November. And we would like to ask you if you could leave or share one important message or thought with everyone listening, what would that be? Chad, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I, I don't want to sound like like Greta and, and just repeat things about how we don't have much time, so get moving. Um, but 
I, I suppose I can just reiterate, yeah, don't don't wait for full certainty before acting. No one, no one expects that and the stakes are too high. Um, there are ways we can make really good decisions uh, without knowing everything. Um, and we have enough really good information. That's changed so much in the past decades or so. Um, yeah, we, we have really good information on what's gonna happen and we just need to start putting that into policy. Thank you, and Hannah? Yeah, I think having launched a crowdsourcing campaign, it would be that you can play your part. Uh, you can help science get the data as fast as we can in this world that is changing a little bit faster than we would like to. Um, so yeah, if you want to help science, join in. Oh, thank you. And thank you for these very thought provoking messages right to end on. Um, I do believe we have one or two puns that I think are important to share before. Where is the best dentist for walruses? <laughs> Tuscaloosa. <laughs> That's funny. Thank you very much, Russ. And Toby, <laughs> go at 2.30. Well, it's 7, not 2.30, but yeah, we're very close to, to going this evening. Um, so on that note, I think we'll we'll end it there. Um, a huge thank you to all of you who have joined us live. And, you know, thank you to those of you who might be watching back at a later point. And of course, a massive thank you to Chad and Hannah, our guest speakers this evening, who have gave some fantastic talks and hopefully lots of you to go away and learn and get involved in. And then we would also like to thank the incredible team that have put these whole three events, the Polar, past, present and future together and who have made this possible. Their names are on the screen there. Uh, so thank you to them. And one last thing, of course, if you want to get involved and you want to hear more about Pint of Science, the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust or the UK Polar Network, you can, of course, go to their social media, follow them uh, and they have lots of events going on all the time, so I'm sure you can join some more and also sign up to their mailing lists as well because they'll send alerts to you. Uh, but uh, on that note, we'll leave it there. Until next time, take care and thank you for joining us this evening.